You're listening to Last Word Radio, where you, you get the last word. Two, one. Welcome to the Fourth Line Podcast, part of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. This is August the 31st, 2020. With you today is myself, Carl and Stevie Nick. I like the merger of both cold opens. It's nice because, you know what? We're all talking about the new normal, Nick. Right? Everyone wants to know what's the new normal. Is this our new normal? Because if it is, I'm okay with it. I mean, it's it certainly feels like it. I think we both agreed that the counting in, it, it was a little exciting. Yeah, exactly. Right? When, when you go to like a, I don't know, a concert. Remember? Do you remember concerts? Oh, what a, what a, what a memory. And all of a sudden, like the lights go dark and the, the countdown goes up on the stage. Oh, yeah. And like, we're doing it. Here we go. The anticipation. Yeah. That's what we've got now. So it felt great. Uh, glad to be back this week. We've got, I mean, what a week in the NHL. What a week. It was, it was a big week in the NHL. And like in professional sports in general, it was a big week. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, I mean, dominated the headlines for reasons we will get to, which reasons you probably already know. Oh, yeah. um, we'll get to those soon. Talk about all these series we've got. I mean, what? We have... Three, all four series are three games to one. So uh, this could be done. It could end Saturday. It could end tomorrow. It could end uh, tomorrow. So we'll get to all of that. Um, we will get to it. One thing I noticed, Nick, as I was just doing that intro and saying the date, we are two thirds of the way through 2020, believe it or not. Two thirds of the way? I feel like we're 12 years into 2020. <laughs> You know what's wild? I got a letter in the mail today, like a piece of mail that was originally, it wasn't like return to sender. It was dated February 18th, 2020 was when the letter I received was written, finally made its way here. So man, that was, that was in the old normal times. Yeah. For those of you who think it takes me a long time sometimes to send out high sticking things. <laughs> Just you wait. Just you wait. <laughs> oh, crazy, man. Well, Nick, before we get to the show, let's talk about the fine folks at CPA Alberta. So CPA Alberta represents more than 29,000 CPAs, chartered professional accountants across the province. And CPAs are more than number crunchers who love Excel spreadsheets, which as a number cruncher who loves Excel spreadsheets, I'm okay if that's who they are. But they're business leaders, finance experts, trusted advisors, and entrepreneurs. They work in many industries from film to fashion, government to oil and gas. I'm sure you work with a CPA at your work. I have some of mine. They're everywhere, Nick. Uh, long story short, CPAs didn't just break the mold. They made their own. So for you to find out all the different things happening with that, especially if you are one, you work in finance, you know someone who is, I think this is really interesting. You can take an inside look at how they're supporting their clients through the pandemic, which is not an easy thing. You can follow them, follow CPA Alberta on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or LinkedIn. You can also visit CPAalberta.com to find out more. Definitely head on over there. They're supporting the Alberta Podcast Network and this show. And so you head on over, check them out. All right, Nick, this week was... uh, Certainly, a a sports led discussion. Uh, what what day was it that we? It was Wednesday night, correct? I think it was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday night, and it actually started. It would have started Wednesday afternoon um, when kind of things started happening. The Milwaukee Bucks, um, they had a game. And they decided that they weren't going to show up. Milwaukee, obviously, in Wisconsin. uh, Another place in Wisconsin, Kenosha. Lots going on there. Uh, Jacob Blake got shot. Lots of protests. Lots of people upset about that. And Milwaukee Bucks said, we've had enough. And they said, we're taking a stand. We're going to make sure that people hear what we have to say about this. We're not playing tonight. Then. 
the rest of the NBA followed suit. Many Major League Baseball teams followed suit. The WNBA followed suit. Tennis followed suit. And we sat and we waited for the NHL to follow suit. And then the puck dropped. So let's start there, Nick. The puck drops that night. What it, What is going through your head? That it shouldn't be dropping. I think that, look, the afternoon game was the, the afternoon game. I, I think that one had already started. You know, I even kind of give them a pass on the early game, the 7 p.m. game, because things were happening so fast. Um, very close to the time puck drop was when all this kind of news was breaking. To me, the unforgivable one, or the inexcusable one, I should say, is the late game. That West Coast Edmonton game, I believe it was Dallas, Colorado. It was, yep. That game should not have been played. The league, the players, everyone was well aware of what was going on in the other professional sports leagues. Um, And that game, to me, felt... it It just felt like they were ignoring everything. It very much did feel like that. It, it was a, a weird feeling in general. Now, as, as a Colorado fan, I, I mostly, I sat there just waiting, refreshing social media as I think, I mean, all of us, not maybe not all of us, but a, a lot of people were kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, they're out for warmups. And I'm like, okay, because we've seen some baseball teams show up have a because uh, it was actually it was Jackie Robinson Day, Jackie Robinson's birthday over this past weekend, so it all kind of ties in nicely. But um, I was like, maybe, maybe they'll go up for warmups and then just not show up for the game. No, they very much did, and it left a very not nice feeling in in my stomach personally. It was uh, to see people around the world taking a stand against racism and then watching the NHL and the players in that moment feel so tone deaf was embarrassing. Well, especially because it comes from a predominantly white league that, you know, it's, it's, you almost get the feeling like, or it, it, you know, their privilege is showing. Yeah. You guys aren't a bunch of black people who have to stand up and cancel your games. It just, it, it, in that moment, it really felt to me like, you know, that, that white privilege was showing and you're right. It was tone deaf. Um, it was a little ignorant. I mean, when you've got, when you've got sports broadcasters on the air saying, I feel awful about covering this game tonight, you've missed the mark somewhere. Yeah. And you could tell from the broadcast side, it was, it was an awkward game to have to call. In totally. General. Totally. Totally. I think I, I tuned in. I did not watch all the game because I, but like I tuned in at the start of the third period and the first few minutes was just, I think it was Scott Oak who was calling that game. And he was just talking about like a game that probably shouldn't be played, which is, it's not something you're, you're used to hearing. No, no. So really not a good look for the NHL um, Wednesday night with their moment of silence and the games happening which only happened for one of the games it went so terribly this is how i mean the nhl while being tone deaf is also does listen because they realized the first game how foolish it looked so much so that they stopped it the second game so there was no mention at all yeah yeah now you know wednesday was wednesday and it happened Thursday is, uh, I think it was Thursday is when we got news that they, the games would not be played that day, that the players had spoken to each other. The players had come together and decided that they were going to sit out um, the games that day and Friday. Yeah. So Thursday, Friday, that way, because they, you know, at that point in time, the players had decided we made a mistake, right? I, I know Nathan McKinnon made the comment. He was like, I'm, embarrassed like we shouldn't have played that game i regret playing wednesday night um and so all the teams sat out thursday friday and it i appreciated 
what they did to take a stand, right? The teams came out. I love seeing all four teams in Edmonton standing there as a whole. That's crazy, right? Statement. Oh my God. I got goosebumps when I saw that. Yeah. So we've got that. We've got the games canceled. Uh, Do you think that that... What do you think is the outcome from that? Because we also saw after, I also really appreciated some of the messages and videos that they did. I think the best ones yet outside of the Matt Dumba speech that we, that he gave those video clips and some of the messages that the players recorded that were played ahead of the game Saturday and Sunday night. Um, what do you think the NHL goes from here with, with what they've done? The players have now kind of, realize i i think that they're not in this bubble you you said their white privilege was showing and i think they've been made abundantly aware of that yeah and like you know what i i also hesitate to sit here and just criticize because change like this does not happen overnight and it it requires learning and it probably requires um, making some mistakes and, you know, very luckily this is a, this is a pretty low stakes mistake to make. Um, but they learn. And I think, you know, I think what's, what's happening now is, is, is they're learning. You can't just stand on the ice or for that matter, kneel on the blue line and say, we skate for black lives. That's not enough. And by the way, now that you've done that, you know, (laughs) you kind of got to act on it. And I think that that's the realization some of these guys are having. And I, you know, at the end of the day, they want to play hockey and they're going to play hockey, but I almost get a bit of a sense based on some of the comments that some of the players made that like, we got to get through the next two to three weeks of hockey. And then we got to take some action. Yeah, it definitely seems like that. And I I do appreciate as well, some of the, that some of this is coming from the white players in the league that it it's not, I mean, we've seen, you know, in certain areas, black athletes, black uh, celebrities saying like, I want my white colleagues to take a stand and to step up in this area. And so to have some of them like Nathan McKinnon, I'm not, not using him as an example of, of greatness, but I'm saying he spoke up and he said, yeah, I made a mistake and is learning from that growing in it uh, and is now working on taking those steps. And so I think, you know, we saw when all these players said, you know, I'm listening, I'm learning. And we said, okay, that's great. Uh, Now we've seen what listening and learning looks like. And I think there's a, a lot more listening and learning to be done. A hundred percent. And you know, what's really encouraging about what you just said about, you know, most of this coming from the white players is that this is, this is not an easy thing to tackle or an easy thing to talk about. I think it was um, Pierre-Edouard Belmer um, who said it in that press conference. He's like, this is awkward. And it is very awkward. And even us, like we're two white guys sitting here talking about it. Like my ears are burning a little bit because Absolutely. It's, a, it's not an easy thing to talk about. Um, but this, you know, things need to change. This is not, we've come across it on social media a lot the last week. This is not a political racism is not political. It's human rights and uh, black lives do matter just as much as everybody else's. And we need to get comfortable saying that and being okay with it. Yeah. And I, um, and you know, like you said, I appreciate the fact that at that press conference, you had Kadri, Belmar, Reeves standing up there. Um, but it's not, it's not them that's going to end racism. Like yeah. you can't, you can't look at the victim of racism and be like, all right, fix it. So it has to be those who, are either actively participating in it or are complicit in sitting alongside. And I think as we've all seen these events play over the last months, I think many of us, myself, and I, I won't speak for you, but probably yourself as well, 
no longer feel comfortable just sitting along being like, yeah, racism is bad. And just saying that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's why we, we talked about this. Like, what do we want to do as a show? And so you'll see on our social media this past week, our high sticking tweets will, we've been posting some of the clips from the players of kind of some of their messaging. Um, and we'll keep doing that. We're going to keep posting things that can spark conversation and encourage positive change in this area because sitting there doing nothing watching hockey doesn't feel like enough anymore. It absolutely is not enough. So, uh, appreciate a lot of what's happening and I appreciate the conversation from a lot of you as well. Um, you know, it's, it's been like Nick said, a little awkward, a little awkward to talk about some of these things, but appreciate those of you who are right. Who are stepping out of your comfort zones or helping others step out of your comfort zones um, and doing this. So I, I, I think in the end, we're going to have some positive change. It just, it might not be tomorrow, but we'll get there. Yeah. We just got to stick with it. Yeah, absolutely. So that happened. We did get back to hockey on Saturday and Sunday. So we've got, and we had a slew of games, three games each of those days. Now we've got right now, we've got game fives happening tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, could be the end of the series like we talked about. But in the, in the middle of all that, which now seems like an eternity ago, Nick, we had a trade. And it's the first trade since the deadline. Which also seems like an eternity ago. But. I don't even remember who was traded at the deadline. But I don't... Okay, so we can go into the details of this trade. But I, really, I truly did not expect to see any trades happen until all 31 teams were in this trade pool. Yeah. They've got a second, they've got a third bubble happening where it's just a bunch of GMs in a room. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was surprised as well, right? Because we heard, right? Kyle Dubas got to his end of the year press conference. He's like, things are going to change. And we're like, Kyle, it's a flat cap. Like, you've got over $10 million for Mitch Murner. But what do you get? Like, there's not much that you're going to be able to change. And yet, before the second round was even finished, Kyle's getting busy. Kyle uh, finds a way. Insert uh, Jurassic Park gif. <laughs> uh, so the trade, as it happened, was Casper Kapanen. But that's not an updated thing at all. I was like, I'll just go to his hockey reference page and go to the transaction section. <laughs> all it had was the original trade where he was traded to Toronto the first time from Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh. Reversed. So Casper Kapanen on his way to Toronto or back to Pittsburgh from Toronto. The main piece coming back, Nick, is Pittsburgh's first overall. I say it like you don't know. Like I say, like <laughs> it's okay, Nick, we need we need to set the the context for the conversation. Yeah, I don't know if you knew this, Nick. Pittsburgh gave up a first round pick for Casper Kapanen. So it was a uh, Kapanen and uh, some pieces back. The main piece going back was a first. Uh, surprising how much Toronto got. Why did, why did Jim Rutherford do this? What is going through this guy's like this? It's the Pittsburgh side where I'm like, they should have waited for the playoffs to end because they could have got way more for that first round pick with 31 teams involved in this. Yeah. It definitely seems like a situation where you get someone and you're like, you look at the trade at the end and you think maybe I should have offered that pick to somebody else instead. <laughs> Right? And like we talked, you, you mentioned Toronto and what are you going to do? I think for the Maple Leafs, Kapanen is one of their most, was one of their most expendable pieces. And oh, he's not even on their cap friendly anymore. I think he was, he was at like 4 3. million, 3.2. So in that range, he was probably one of their kind of easiest pieces to move. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you're not going to get much. You're not going to get a first for Alexander Kerfoot at 3.5 and you're not going to get a first for Andreas Johnson at 3.4. Nope. And he, he's those, those role players, right? Where yeah. you have to now, you cannot have, when you're paying that much for your top players, you cannot afford to spend that much on role players or that many but, at that much. But, but Carl, are role players worth first round picks now? Nope. That's a that's a tough that's a tough sell to me. Cause so Kapanen, I mean, a down year, right? This is was arguably probably his worst year 
in the league. And I think what Pittsburgh's, I mean, not what they, they have to be hoping that this was not the real captain, that they can find a way to get more out of him than what he did this year. This year, 13 goals, 36 points, 20 goals last year. Uh, I guess on pace for about the same, but uh, I would say that price tag for 20, 25 goals is fine. Yeah. Like no, salary I, wise, salary wise. I totally agree. The cap is not awful. It's awful on the Maple Leafs, but in general, it's not awful. And I think that Pittsburgh can get more out of him. I think the, I think the guy's got a big confidence problem. For sure. And that's, and it's because they never, the Leafs never used him consistently. He was always moving around. Yeah. So you put him on, you know, some of Pittsburgh's established veterans, wings, Crosby, Malkin, he'll be, he'll do great in Pittsburgh. Yeah. I think it's, it's one of those things where bringing him in with some of that talent, like you said, some of those veteran pieces, I think will certainly help him develop. And Pittsburgh has to, because man, that first fifteenth overall pick in a draft this deep is a big price tag. So, what would make it worth it for them? Twenty goals out of Kapanen? Twenty five? It's got to be twenty five. At least you, you you can get twenty. Chris Kunitz can score twenty five goals on Crosby's wing. Man, that's not worth first round pick. Remember when Chris Kunitz made the Olympic team because Crosby was on it? Yeah. And then scored the gold medal winning goal. Oh, I was so mad, but happy. They're like, they're like, hey, Crosby. It's, it's like when you, you know, you're going to, I don't know, Canada's Wonderland as a kid. That's something you probably did. And yes. uh, and they're like, you can bring a friend. That was that was Crosby at the Olympics. They're like, hey, Sid, <laughs> bring bring a friend. He's like, like a roommate? No, like you can have someone on the team. You get one guy. <laughs> If That's you great. Could bring, if you could bring one, let's say you're going to the Olympics and you could bring one player with you to the Olympics, who are you bringing? One player? Yeah. Any player on any team? Yeah. Like an NHL player? Or are you asking? Yeah. Like, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> like, you want to know Ryan from my beer league team? How he do? <laughs> Is he good? <laughs> He swears a lot. Well, he'd probably fit right in with these NHL players then. But we've, <laughs> we've gotten some live mics this playoffs, Nick. <laughs> no, I, I, I just I, was thinking, like, if, wow, really, Chris Kunitz is who you're bringing? <laughs> you know who I'd bring? Steven Stamkos. Because, man, that guy deserves to play in a high-stakes game at least once. <laughs> this, this Tampa team is going to move on to the conference finals probably within the next 30 minutes and he's not going to sniff the ice the entire time. I feel so bad for this guy and the year of the Olympics, he snapped his leg with, Oh, I can still hear his screams in my head, oh, but I could see that. That's gross. Anyways, poor guy. I bring Steven Stamkos. That's a, that's a great answer. All right. Um, yeah, Toronto, what's interesting is so Toronto did not have a first round pick because they used that first round pick, which they did not know would be so high to get rid of Patrick Marlowe. Yep. And so now they've then salary dumped Kasperi Kapanen and Patrick Marlowe, and they're in the same spot. And apparently Justin Hollander, or, uh, Hollander who they get got in that trade as well, um, he is not too bad. It's Philip Hollander. I don't know who Justin Hollander is. <laughs> Justin Hall is a current Maple Leaf. Philip Hollander, uh, apparently not a not a terrible piece either. So yeah, I had never heard this name before. And then after this trade, everyone on Twitter was like, "Oh my God, the Penguins' best prospect is on their way to Toronto." But I've never heard of this guy before. Which, when you continually, even in a year when you pick fifteenth overall, trade your first overall pick, your first round pick, yeah. Philip Hollander is going to be your best prospect. That sounds about right. <laughs> or even Justin Hollander, whoever that is. He might be. <laughs> is he on your beer league team? No, we don't have a Justin. Unless he's one of the rotational guys who just shows up when we only have six people oh. playing. You get you get extra people showing up. I always just we just had to play with six. Randomly, we we will if we're lucky. If we're lucky, this Leafs team is not done. I don't think Kyle Dubas is done. He can't be done. 
I mean, we saw rumors today, and we we said before the show we weren't going to get into rumors, but uh, we saw rumors of Freddie Anderson being on the move. Yeah, there's... Which I think probably has to happen at some point for them, but what are they going to do if he's not their goalie? And there's tons of goalies on the market this year. Um, they can't afford definitely... them. I think the, I mean, the goalie market, in a, I think Sergei Bobrovsky murdered the goalie market. I think everyone looks at his contract and is like, yeah, we're not going to pay a goalie a lot of money right now. Fair, fair. Hey, did something happen with Sergei Bobrovsky this week? I saw something that he deleted his social media for some reason. Probably because he makes $10 million a year. <laughs> He's like, I don't need social media. Yeah. No, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen some rumor, again, more trade rumors about him. But uh, Okay. He's probably just sick of seeing his name pop up on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, let's, let's start. Keep talking about first round picks. Do you want to do that? Sure. Arizona Coyotes. They don't have one this year because they traded it for Taylor Hall. And now they don't have one next year. They also don't have a second round pick this year. They have lost them. If you think back, Nick, uh, like a long time ago, we talked about how the Coyotes got in some trouble for illegally testing junior players. Okay, yes. So this is not a new story. This is not a new story. Okay, I I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) If you're a longtime listener of our own show like we are, you may remember we talked about it. It felt so familiar to me. I was like, again? (laughs) Yeah, they uh, no. this is, I mean, the NHL was like, we have time. We can wait to hand out this punishment. Let's do it in the middle of the second round of the playoffs, because why not? After the Coyotes GM has quit and they've replaced him with someone else, then let's hand out the punishment and really make Steve Sullivan not super happy with his job. Well, obviously, because Gary's just sitting at his kitchen table with a napkin. You can just see him on the Zoom call holding up the napkin to Bill Daly. Here's what I drew up. (laughs) Scan it. Shoot it off. I don't know. What do you think? Was Was it too harsh of a penalty? That is steep. I thought it was pretty. I thought it was pretty harsh. I mean, we've seen in other professional sports leagues, teams cheat in much more significant ways and get much less significant of a penalty. Yeah, especially if you consider winning a championship a penalty. <laughs> right. The Houston Astros got a, a World Series and got less of a punishment than they did. Um, yeah, I. but if that's the NHL stance, that cheating is bad, and if you cheat, you get in trouble, I'm on board with it. You just got to, like, I don't know, you got to temper the, the cheats a little bit because, <laughs> yeah, look, they cheated. This, to me, isn't, like, a crazy rule-breaking. Like, they broke the rule of, of the law that's in, I think I saw the NHL Constitution in an article I read. Um, but it's not, it, I don't know, to me, it doesn't, it's not affecting the outcome of a game right now. Yep. So now what happens when somebody cheats that affects the outcome of a game? The penalty is going to have to be harsher. Absolutely. Right. If you, if you found out, and I think we talked about this before, of like, how could you cheat in the NHL? Yeah. And I think if you were to find some sort of way, like you, you put magnets in the ice, yeah, right underneath the goalie crease, and all of a sudden he can't move. That'd be that's bad. a that's a great idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like it looks like it looks like you were frozen on that one. Yeah, I I literally was. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. No, I think it, I don't know. I think it's I think it's pretty harsh, and it's it's kicking a team while they're down too. See, I I don't ex I don't think that that's an acceptable reason to not punish a team. If that's what your punishment is going to be, it doesn't matter that the Coyotes are in a rough spot as an organization. I think that you, because that becomes your standard, and it can't be like, well, the St. Louis Blues just won the championship last year, so we'll dock them two first round picks instead. Because well, they've won, and the Coyotes never have. No, but that we know the MLB set the standard champions don't get punished. Well, exactly. St. Louis <laughs> probably has already done this, right? 
Um, yeah, I guess you're right about that. Then I guess I just feel bad that the Coyotes are being kicked while they're down. <laughs> oh, exactly. Because we, I mean, do you, what do you think the consequences for them are from this? With them looking at P, right, Taylor Hall, you coming back when you, there's no picks in the first round the next two years? Well, I think I don't think Taylor Hall was coming back when there was picks in the first round for the next two years. Sure, like there's a chance they have, you know, the initial negotiating time with him. Um, but I think they were going to have a pretty tough sales job ahead of them, regardless of this. So you you don't think it impacts their roster decisions or their go for? Yeah, rebuild? I think no, I think it has. It does affect that. It has to affect that. Now that you're not picking, you know, especially, okay, let's say you lose Taylor Hall. Where do you project your self finishing next year without Taylor Hall? Who, if, who can you go out and get to replace Taylor Hall? Like it's not, it's not that easy. And if they start to project themselves finishing lower and lower in the standings, they don't have those draft picks. So they got to go out and find ways to get better players. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh... And they're, now they got to find a GM who's going to have a heck of a job in front of him with no high picks over the next two years. Yeah, the the cupboard. I mean, you can't go at the trade deadline and make a trade to pick someone up like they did this year, right? Yeah. Those, those first round picks, you can't call up the Pittsburgh Penguins and be like, "Hey, can we have your first round pick?" Because they don't have any anymore. So <laughs> that's right. They've already traded them away. Anyways, the Coyotes are in for a rough go. I feel bad for their fan. They didn't. They didn't ask for this. There was. They got no benefit from this because now the picks that they would have scouted not there. So yeah, they had a rough go, and it really hurts the momentum they started building in this return to play. Yeah, I mean the momentum of losing fourteen to two combined in your last two games of the playoffs <laughs> is some strong but momentum. They, you but don't want to lose that. <laughs> but they made the playoffs. <laughs> they did. They got to play in like the actual real playoffs. So yeah, they got to play hockey in warm weather. And that's really all we can ask for. That's all you can ask for in Arizona. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to the games that are happening. I said that Tampa was thirty minutes away from moving on, and then mere minutes later, Boston scored on the power play to tie this game up. Tampa has run away with this series in a way that after this look, watching them in the first game did not look possible. Yeah, no, they've completely taken it over. They've shut down the Bruins. A lot of this, I mean, there was uh, the big game where Tampa put up a, what, seven, eight goals. Uh, But outside of that, it does feel like Boston has given up at this point in time. And I wonder, and I, I still don't put any blame on him, but I do think a significant part of that is the lack of Tuka Rask. I was just going to ask you if you thought that had anything to do with it. I agree. I think that took the wind out of them. I think so, right? That's the guy. You you talk about the confidence you have in your goalie. They had that. And they, I mean, last round they had that in Halak. And yeah. then it disappeared. And on the other end of the spectrum... I think Tampa has all the confidence in the world in their goalie. He has played amazing. He has been everything that they needed him to be. This, this Tampa team feels like they've worked out everything that they couldn't get over in that first round last year. They're just playing so much tighter, so much closer um, to their opponents and just keeping it shut down in their end. They've really tightened up their defensive game. Absolutely. And that tonight they got Ryan McDonough back, which uh, helps with that as well. Huge. Yeah, that's huge for them. And Hedman, who everyone thought was going to be injured and out, is playing huge minutes every game. Yeah. Yeah. Tampa, I mean, Tampa's like, their defense is just a collection of players that you like forget still play in the league. Yeah, like the, the playoff start, I was like, oh, yeah, Kevin Shattenkirk, he's on this team. And you see, like, oh, Zach Bogosian. That's a, that's a guy who still plays. Both of whom are still playing pretty well. Right. Like, I mean, there have been some moments where they've looked bad, but some very good moments. I thought, I mean, they could, they could try out for your beer league team. 
Oh my God. I wouldn't even charge them league fees. <laughs> <laughs> Just come win me a championship guys. <laughs> but Zach Bogosian is the guy that was chased out of Buffalo. Yeah. Remember that? I thought that was the end of him. I thought that was the end of his career. I think if you get chased at a Buffalo, that is literally the end of your career. <laughs> That's a lot of coaches whose careers are done. Exactly. <laughs> um, so with, with what we've seen from Tampa, because I, I agree, at the, at the start of this series, with what Boston was able to do, I thought they, Boston shut them down so well in game one. And I thought again, I was like, man, John Cooper cannot make the adjustments he needs to with this team. And now we've seen that they have, right? They're, they're playing their game while managing to shut down Boston's. Is this, is this the team that then you think is good enough to win the Stanley Cup against, to me, Vegas, the next best team? Yes, I, I do think so. I mean, if you're going all the way to the finals, I think it's a, it's a harder thing to call whether they're going to beat whatever team comes out of the West. Um, but I think that, you know, Boston was a team to beat in the East for them. And if they can get through them in the second round, I think they're destined for the Stanley Cup Finals. Well, I guess if we assume that the Islanders can win one out of the next three games, Tampa versus the Islanders is a very big dichotomy in play styles. Yeah. I mean, I don't assume anything about the Islanders anymore. <laughs> right. I guess that is... Because you mentioned about how they managed to overcome whatever they had against Columbus last year. That's the ultimate test, right? To play against the better Columbus. You want to show your, <laughs> you, you want to show that? There you go. Oh, man, I love that. The better Columbus. Yes. And can Minnesota be the worst Columbus? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fully. That's great. So I think we'll see. We'll find out next round if they can do that. I mean, I think they could, but every round I've said that whatever team the Islanders are playing can beat them. So I might not be the best person to listen to on this one. I mean, you're not alone in that. You are no. not alone. I know. All right. Well, let's, let's t- touch on that series then. Islanders up 3-1. The Flyers, no matter what they have, Carter Hart cannot do it all anymore. No, he didn't even play last night. They went, I mean, on the back to back, both teams went backups. We got Thomas Grace and Brian Elliott, which is exactly what you want. Man, it's crazy. When I turned that game on, it was during the national anthems. And when I switched to it, it was the close up of, of Brian Elliott. And as soon as I turned on, I was like, oh man, who's that old guy who plays for the Islanders? Like, that guy looks like he should be a coach <laughs> from the close up. But it was Brian I, Elliott. I think, uh, I imagine that in your head, you're like, man, this playoffs has been rough on Carter. (laughs) He is not looking good. Yeah. I thought 2020 was hard on me. (laughs) Carter Hart. Yeah. That's like Elliot Friedman, but worse. (laughs) (laughs) But Brian Elliott played a pretty good game last night. He did. I mean, he was not the reason. It's still repeatedly game after game. The fact that Philadelphia cannot get any scoring. And they're just like cycling guys in. The fact that JVR repeatedly has been a healthy scratch this playoffs is mind-boggling to me. It's not great for them. A team coming in that was, you know, mostly known for, or, or I guess touted for their depth and that they should be able to get production from all four lines. They're really getting production from none of their lines. Yeah, their lines, I mean, they do have, equal depth up and down the lineup right now it's just it's just bad it's the same depth just poor depth <laughs> yeah when you when you're rolling out four fourth lines it's not good no it's very bad it'll be interesting to see how they respond tomorrow i'm kind of at that point though like with all of these g- series you had that chance to show how you respond it's game five. You've lost 75% of your game so far in this series. And, and, and we'll get to a big one of those in a second. But I just, I feel like you had your chance. 
it's over. I think that's true of Philadelphia. I think that with this series, there's, uh, I don't, I, based on what we've seen so far, I don't see how Philadelphia crawls out of this one. That's right. Is, is there a series that you look at and think you don't believe that? I think that I th- I think that if any team's going to do it, it's Colorado. Don't Nick, don't. They're the one, and I'll tell you why, Carl. I haven't watched many of these games because because they start so late, and I'm an old man. But when I went to when I I can't remember what day they were on, but I came I came upstairs. Oh, they were on a 6 p.m. game. And after putting my daughter to bed, I came downstairs. My wife had the game on. They were losing 3-0, okay? And then the next day when I checked the score, it was 5-4. to four. Like, they almost crawled themselves out of that hole. I don't know how bad your day went, Nick, but that day that you checked the score was this morning. That game was last night. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> See what I mean about how 2020 feels like it's been 12 years? <laughs> yeah. I hear that. That yeah, was that yesterday game. that I had that conversation? Yeah. That game saw Michael Hutchinson come in net. That's what, so, you, that's what happened after you went to bed. So this is – Michael Hutchinson got playoff time. So <laughs> this is my question to you. If Philip Grubauer is in net for the series, is your team down three games to one? Do they lose last night? No. Papa Franco is a fine backup to give you some time off for your starter, but he is not looked comfortable in several instances. Now, granted, last night, last night was a weird one. I mean, he got down three nothing. I think several of those goals could have been stopped and, and were – stoppable and what kills me is the fact again games change based on small things i don't know if you saw when you woke up this morning the kale mccarr giveaway nick i did not see that no i have never been so sad at young kale as i have (laughs) in that moment i was gonna say it must have been pretty bad for you to bring it up it was so bad he essentially like Franco just handed him the puck behind the net and entirely unforced. He just coughed it up in front of the net right through Franco's legs for what ended up being the game winner. See, those are mistakes that really can't happen in the playoffs. No, I mean, and Grant, it was, it was two nothing or sorry. It was a two goal lead at that time. Uh, and the Avs scored an empty net or, uh, goal with the net empty with two and a half seconds left. So it was probably wouldn't have ended in the same way. It probably wouldn't have mattered, but still it did. Would you say the avalanche have a good mix of like veteran players and young players? Or think, experienced players? I think that they could use a little bit more. The problem, though, is that we're getting to that point that some of the veteran talent on this team is ones that have not gotten the experience winning in the playoffs. Right. So, like, Gabe Landeskog, no longer a young kid in this league, right? Captain of this team. Hasn't done it. Defensively, we've got, we've got you know, Ian Cole. He's done it. Eric Johnson... He hasn't, right? He's a veteran on that blue line. He's one of two. Uh, we've got, you know, Nazem Kadri, not a young player, veteran on that team. He finally made it to the second round. He, actually, if they lose tomorrow night, fingers crossed, he'll finish a playoff without getting suspended. So it's West Coast games. The, the game's rougher in the West. Okay, so here's why I asked that question, okay? They... They have all the tools in place. They have the talent to come back from this series. But it really, like at this point for them, it's a mental game. And 
you need, this is why I ask if they have experience because with experience, it's much easier for you to take it one game at a time. All you have to do is win, win tomorrow. And then you deal with the next game after that. But I think with younger players who don't have that experience, um, they take, you know, they, they fall into the Carl mindset of this series is over. I we're down yeah. three games to one. How can you come back from this? When you can't think like that, you got to just, you play tomorrow and you win tomorrow and then you tackle the next game after that. Well, in the mental side of the game, it has been what, like that Kale McCarr just blunder last night is kind of the epitome of this series. Dallas has been good, but they have not been unbeatable. They are not, they have not played 3 1, head into the conference finals level hockey. If they get to the next round, I mean, I would expect that a very good Vegas team will do quick work of them. Because Dow- Colorado has played very poorly from their own side. And a lot of it is mental. Like, it seems like Grubauer and Eric Johnson are gone, and all of a sudden they lost that confidence, right? Yeah. Like Tuka Rask, right? Yeah, it does like, feel like that. And so, for me, I do think, you know, Coach Bender said today, he said, we've got a bunch of grumpy guys in that room. You better be. You better be grumpy. If you're down 3-1 and you're not furious with how you've played when you've played as terribly as they have, you better be or else the guys in there who aren't grumpy get rid of them they're gone so anyways they, congratulations to the Dallas they, they, <laughs> <laughs> we'll know tomorrow we'll know tomorrow we'll know tonight they played tonight nick oh they play tonight they are playing tonight. This what is the day, game. What day is it? <laughs> Today it is Tuesday. We will know. Uh, it's Monday. They're, they're actually they're gonna they're gonna play after you go to bed. That game will start. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, you'll wake up in the morning and find out that Dallas moved on. Great. So, uh, which brings us to Vegas and Vancouver. Another three-one series. Vegas is up, kind of just like we all expected, right? Yeah, I think this one's over. <laughs> I think this one's over. I think Vancouver has shown how how good of a team that they are right now, and they've shown that they have potential going forward. But they're not going to be able to get past this Vegas team. No, I was I was impressed last night of them coming back and taking that lead, which actually was an interesting stat. They said uh, that it was the first lead change in the series, which is always fun when you get to the fifth game and finally have a lead change. Riveting hockey in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've watched a little bit of this series and all of it's just been like, wow, Vegas is really good. That's, That's what runs through my head every time I see it. Vegas is really good. They are what the Flyers thought they were. Yeah, they're... Yeah, I'm not even going to say they're what the Flyers should be because after what we've seen, they're not. <laughs> they're what the Flyers thought they were. That's perfect. The The Islanders are a better Columbus. Vegas is a better Philadelphia. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we'll, we will be able to, next Monday night, we'll be previewing the conference finals. Uh, we'll see how long some of these series last. It'll end Saturday. And then we've got to pack everything up and move from Toronto to Edmonton. I was just going to say, you guys are, there's going to be more teams out West. Well, not more, the same amount of teams out West, just different teams. You just, you lose all of your teams in Toronto. Yeah. That's okay. I literally would not know the difference. I, it, I mean, I know that uh, Alberta made a case to the NHL of how great it would be if they came here. You're right. It doesn't matter. No, I, I have no idea why they decided to do it in Edmonton versus Toronto. Doesn't really matter from our perspective, I don't think. No, but here we are, and uh, we're doing it. So we'll be back next week to uh, to preview some of those. The is there a team that you think right now? I I tried to put you on the spot in regards to the Stanley Cup final. Vegas is looking real good. Of the Eight teams theoretically left playing. 
what would be your Stanley Cup final and who is the winner? Oh, Tampa and I'd say Vegas. And I think Tampa wins it. I was like, Nick, don't you don't you dare try to get me upset and say Colorado. Don't you dare. No, honestly, I was gonna say Dallas. And I was like, if I say Dallas, I'm gonna have to justify it. And I cannot come up with a justification right now. <laughs> That's very, very fair. <laughs> yeah, I would I would have the same final and I would probably I would go Vegas. I think that they do <laughs> I think that they just, they have that depth that Tampa doesn't necessarily have. Um, and they can get by. Not, I'm not saying Tampa's a bad team, but I mean, hey, maybe they'll get Stamkos back. That'd be some you good think, depth. Oh, man, poor guy. I, I hope they do. I hope they do. Much like, I mean, in the same way that, not in the same way. I take that back. Change of topic. It was so great seeing Oscar Lindblom back taking warm-ups for the Flyers. It really was. And that was one of the, like, the motivational rallying points that I thought would really propel the Flyers through the playoffs. Yeah. But not even that could do it. You know what, though? It's, it's nice to have a good news story here in 2020. It's, it is great. I think we can all, can and should all celebrate it. Absolutely. Yeah, great to see. All right, Nick. Uh, this has been the show. We want to let you know about I, i've never said that has been the show so early into the show i'm like just just making sure that everyone oh okay i'm, I'm just gonna turn off right now because I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say there's like four other things you have to do yeah whoops and you know i could go back and edit that but now i've talked way too much about it it's gotta stay yeah um so we've got the high sticking we're doing those um we last time we, we handed out a random winner we've handed out the draw i hope to hand out both the the play-in round and the first round uh gonna try to get those mailed out this weekend i know that uh know that i said that i was gonna get it done last weekend to some of the folks out there but luckily they're understanding well i think everyone knows now after tonight's episode that they can expect their prizes in six to eight months <laughs> And it's it's fine, right? As long as we get it done, we'll get your prize to you before Pittsburgh has a first round pick. How about that? I think that's fair. And if you can't meet that timeline, we're in bigger trouble. <laughs> Even using Canada Post. <laughs> uh, so high sticking. The way it works is you pick who you think is going to score game winning goals. And the what's going to get interesting is we're going to be down to only two series and a maximum of 14 games and you could end up winning it just by like getting two or three of them right because there's so few games and honestly picking who you think is going to score a game-winning goal when you only get to pick one person not that easy so it's very, it's very hard yeah so kudos to those who've managed to do it um like last night this is how this is how much people don't give uh mm-hmm. dallas credit i know that you were going to try to make your case and couldn't here's a prime example of it only one person picked any dallas star to score a game-winning goal last night in he got a point no one else did it's that easy <laughs> so you can do that head on over to our po- our twitter at fourth line podcast send them in we we post the, the tweets in the morning we hand out the scores you can go to the fourth line podcast.com and find the standings there. Uh, that's one of our many drop downs there. You can find the standings um, and see if you've been playing, how many points you have. And if you do it and I haven't readjusted the scores, uh, if I've like only left it based on trying to update the tweet, the tweets, uh, you get to just get the scores in a random order, which is always fun to find out who's actually in first. So we make you do some of the work for you, which is always nice. Um, fourthlinepodcast.com where you can find out all the places to find us this is your first time listening welcome uh excited to have you here give us a subscribe so that you'll find us again next week we're on all of your podcast listening devices tune in check that out and make sure to if you have enjoyed the show give us a review and if you haven't enjoyed the show you can send us a dm we'll 
can tell us. That's fine. We appreciate constructive criticism. I'm Nick's laughing. I don't. I'm not sure why. No, I would much rather them send us a DM than leave that as a review. <laughs> like yes. you can still get it out of your system. Just send it to us privately. If we've upset you in any way, you can tell us. Absolutely. Yeah. So please do. Um, you can also find us every Monday night here. We'll be back with the new stuff. Here's a, an interesting thing I want to tell you about Nick before we wrap up the show though. All right. So, uh, the, I think we've talked about, I, I know we've talked about this before. Uh, there's a, a very interesting podcast out there that's super relevant, especially right now in, in some areas of the world called world on fire, which is a podcast out of CBC Edmonton. And it's a five part series that takes you to the front lines of out of control wildfires in Canada, Australia, and California, which is, you know, a big thing, especially in BC and California right now, lots of big fires happening. So yeah. interesting. This was recorded during COVID-19 pandemic by host Adrian Lamb and Mike Flanagan. And they look, take a look at what it takes to find hope in the midst of fear and destruction and how communities affected by wildfires rebuild. It examines the high cost that wildfires causes to people's health, homes, and communities. And I think that that's a, I mean, it, it's a, a glimpse into the wildfire thing, but definitely relates to a lot of what's happening outside in the rest of our world right now. So super interesting. Take a listen. You can find it on the CBC Listen app, wherever you find your podcast. You can also find it online at cbc.ca slash world on fire. Check it out because, I mean, that's a super interesting topic, uh, kind of how that, what happens after the fact. Because we always see the big news of it happening, but rarely see what happens after. So uh, super interesting topic there. We'll be back next week. We'll be wrapping up the second round for you, looking towards the conference finals. And uh, who knows what else is going to happen in the next week, Nick? Could be anything. Who knows? And you know what, Carl, I'm going to abstain from singing a song tonight because I'd like to end the show kind of where we started it and just say that Black Lives Matter. <laughs> <laughs>